You're watching a TV show called Racket Squad. Sorry about the quality, but it's from 1951, the very early days of television. The actress on the screen, the one with the dark hair, is Madge Meredith. This is the first thing she did after, well, the unpleasantness. You see, this was made right after she was released from prison. Yes, Madge served over two years in a federal prison for kidnapping and assault. Look, he even took my rings. Her real name was Marjorie May Massow. Marjorie was born on July 15, 1921 in the small town of Iowa Falls, Iowa. She was the third child out of five for Frank and Laura Massow. They were a lower middle class family that didn't have a lot of money, yet always seemed to make ends meet. As a child, she suffered from stuttering, especially under nervous situations. But she vowed to overcome it as she dreamed of becoming a famous film star. In school, the teachers would ask the children what they wanted to be when they grow up. A farmer, one would say. An artist, another would offer. Marjorie always had the same answer. She knew that someday she would be an actress and a good one. And while many girls had that dream, Marjorie had something going for her. She was damn good looking. And she became an excellent speaker at Iowa Falls High School. It was a dramatics teacher, Miss Carolyn Gallagher, that took the young girl under her wing. It was with Miss Gallagher's help that Marjorie was able to get a scholarship at the Fidella Rice School of Theater in Oaks Bluff, Massachusetts. But there was one problem. The school only provided money for tuition and the family had no money for her living expenses. But an acting career, she recalled, always meant so much to me that I went east anyway. Sure, I'd find some way to support myself. To earn money, she would scrub floors, clean dormitories, wait on tables, anything to get by. And she was always acting any chance she got. Now, while at the school, Marjorie was involved in a murder. Well, she was called to testify during a murder trial. At the Rice School, before the sun rose on June 30th, 1940, during a thunderstorm, no less, 70-year-old Miss Clara M. Smith was murdered by someone who climbed through her window. Now, if you look at her picture from the murder trial, you might say, that girl is a little heavier than the actress we know as Madge Meredith. Well, you're right. In this article, she explained that she had suffered from a throat infection that affected her thyroid, and that caused her going from 120 pounds to 165. Though she said it helped her get character parts on the stage. Anyway, she finally began a diet with pills prescribed by a doctor. As far as the murder trial goes, I don't know the outcome. That might be another video for another day. Anyway, after four summers at the school, she traveled to New York where she spent a year at the Theodora Irvine School of the Theater. She also worked as a waitress to make ends meet, though she did find small acting roles on Broadway. But her dream wasn't to be a stage actor, but a Hollywood star. So the 20-year-old moved to the West Coast, and her family had so much faith in her, they went along for the ride. They wound up living in a small Culver City bungalow almost in the backyard of the MGM lot. Like thousands of other pretty girls with stars in their eyes, she did everything she could to make her dreams come true. She registered at Central Casting, attempted without success to join the Screen Actors Guild, took vocal lessons, visited every agent she could find, and even read magazines like The Hollywood Reporter. Before she knew it, a year had gone by and she was no closer to being a success than she was when she got there. A very discouraged Marjorie Massow took a job in a delicatessen. At this new job, she was put in charge of buying supplies. One day she went to a wartime food auction and there was a man who took notice of her. The following day, this rich Hollywood restaurant supply distributor arrived at the delicatessen. He introduced himself as Leon DeMars. I noticed you at the auction, he said, 
and got your name from the auctioneer. I can get the supplies that you need. And he did just that, and soon he was a friend, not only with her, but with her family. He would occasionally take Marjorie and her sister to the ballet. One day while visiting their home, he found her crying. Asking her mother what was wrong, her mother told him, she has her heart set on getting into pictures. She isn't getting anywhere in spite of years of drama study. So she wants to be in pictures, DeMars said. Well, maybe I can help. He also told her, it's simple, I'll get you into pictures. All you have to do is do what I tell you. And the next thing she knew, she had a job at 20th Century Fox. Not in the movies, however, but as a cashier in the commissary. Hey, it might not be acting, but at least she would get to see some of those famous people face to face. And just maybe she thought, she might even get a chance to talk to them. But to her disappointment, most of the big names didn't go to the studio commissary as they preferred places like Café de Paris. Yet one day in late summer, a star did come by, Jennifer Jones, the recent star of The Song of Bernadette. She noticed the young pretty girl at the cashier's desk. As Jennifer paid the check, she asked, wouldn't you like to take a screen test? Yes, Marjorie answered meekly. Not only did Jennifer get her a screen test, but she acted with her as well. It all went good, but they had one suggestion, for her to get her nose fixed, which Marjorie happily did. Real waitress, spotted by a talent scout in a Hollywood restaurant, pretty Marjorie Massa was screen tested and signed to a contract. Her first film role, a waitress. Photo shows her calling home to tell her folks the good news, or the story goes. Soon she had a contract and a part in a film. It was a bit part in Without Reservations with Claudette Colbert. After she got the female lead in the film, take it or leave it with Eddie Ryan and Phil Baker. But besides a small role in the Otto Preminger film, In the Meantime, Darling, that was about it for Marjorie at 20th Century Fox. Like happens to so many young starlets, her option was not picked up. Leon DeMars now offered to go beyond being a friend and advisor, but to work as her agent. She eventually learned that his real name was Nick the Greek Giannakalos. He was married and had a daughter a few years younger than her. He was an immigrant who was born in Greece in 1905 and entered the U.S. in 1930. Marjorie let Nick take over her life. He told me I must never smoke, drink, or go out with men. I was never allowed to go out with one boy during my four and a half years under his guidance. I was allowed only to be with my family or Greeks he introduced to me or with him. I didn't mind the strict discipline because my career was the only thing I cared for. She went to work at RKO. I don't know if that was because of Nick or not, but it was at RKO where she changed her name from Marjorie Massau to Madge Meredith. She appeared in the films Child of Divorce, Trail Street with Randolph Scott, and The Falcon's Adventure with Tom Conway. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so terribly sorry. That's all right. Pleasure's all mine. Shouldn't we be at the travel agency by now? Where are you taking me? Let me out of here. Stop this cab. Shut up. So isn't that the girl we met in the hotel? Yeah, but what difference does it make? Any? She's in a jam. It was during the Falcon film that a minor incident happened. Film star injured when life raft explodes in an elevator. Tom Conaway and Madge Meredith suffered painful facial bruises when a life raft exploded in a passenger elevator during the filming of a scene for the Falcon adventure. The villain of the story had inflated the raft to block the actor's exit from an elevator. The freak accident occurred when the air compressor inflating the raft failed to shut off. 
Noise from the explosion was heard throughout the studio. Now I know what you're thinking. What about the kidnapping and assault you mentioned at the beginning? Well, the trouble began in September of 1946. Madge wanted to buy a new home for her and her family. She fell in love with the home at 8444 Magnolia Drive in the Hollywood Hills. I fell in love with the house but was $5,000 short on the purchase price, she said. I called on my family for aid, but Nick finally said he would put up the $5,000 to complete the transaction. I took out two life insurance policies to protect Nick's investment. Madge, her mother, sister, and her husband, along with their kids, all moved into the new home. Joining them was Nick Giannakalis, the idea being that he could help Madge work on her acting. The trouble was, at the same time, real agents began to take an interest in her. When she signed with a real agency, Nick got furious and kicked the whole family out of the house. It was also rumored that he was mad because she refused his sexual advances. What Madge didn't realize was, when Nick had her sign some papers over the $5,000, she actually signed the house over to him. The actress charged, she thought she was signing a note for a loan when she signed a deed giving Giannakalis ownership of the property. She took court action to try to get the home back, but then on July 1st, 1947, Nicholas Giannakalis, bleeding from the forehead, and his bodyguard, Vern Davis, turned up at a Hollywood police station with a bizarre story. They claimed that they were dragged from their car, kidnapped, and beaten. They were kept prisoners for nine hours before escaping. And it was none other than Marge Meredith, who was at the scene, who was the mastermind behind it all. Hollywood, July 1st. Movie actress Marge Meredith's business manager told police she kidnapped him after a row in which he refused to return property he had deeded to her to hide it from his wife's lawyers. An all-points bulletin was issued for the arrest of Miss Meredith, 26, on suspicion of kidnapping, robbery, and assault with intent to commit murder. She appeared in the Falcon series and with Randolph Scott in Trail Street. Nicholas Giannakalis, 38, her business manager and wealthy restaurant supply wholesaler, and his associate, Vern W. Davis, 32, both of North Hollywood, escaped from an armed guard in Lopez Canyon Monday. They said they had been seized, beaten, and bound as they drove to work. She waved to us to follow her back, he said. Then she swung her car across the road so we couldn't get by. Another car pulled up behind us, and she shouted to the man in it, that's them! Go get them! They forced us out of the car, made us lie on the ground. They pulled out guns and beat us with blackjacks. They beat us to a pulp. Giannakalis said, I found her in a delicatessen and made an actress out of her. And she does this to me? That's gratitude for you. And while the police were looking for her, some strange things started to turn up. One of the accused kidnappers, a man named Albert W. Tucker, 29, claimed something different. Tucker said, They were having trouble over their ownership of a house, and Giannakalis wanted us to get the girl in trouble. He hired me to kidnap him and arrange the beating. On July 3rd, 1947, Madge gave herself up. According to her, it was all a plot by Giannakalis to ruin her career. It's perfectly ridiculous, she said. If anybody was threatened, it was me. He waved a piece of pipe in my face. Meredith said she was at the scene, but was called there by Giannakalis to discuss ownership of the house. When I got there, he had one or more men with him. I'm not sure how many. When I tried to escape, they tried to pin my car to the side of the road. I was the one who needed protection. On July 9th, she was released on $5,000 bond. Another witness came forward, 21-year-old Barbara Wentworth, who told a tale of being in a motel the night before the kidnapping with Marge and three men. 
She testified she saw two guns and a leather sap. And I assume a sap is something like a blackjack? Then she said the following morning, one of the men, Albert W. Tucker, gave her $50 to rent a car. Though I should point out that later during the trial, she denied ever saying that. Now on top of all this, Madge was also being sued for $65,732 in damages. Tucker testified at the trial that he had been hired by Giannakalis for $5,000, money that was not yet paid, to frame Miss Meredith so she would be blackballed in Hollywood. He said that he had administered the beatings to Giannakalis and that when he offered to tape up the wounds to stop the bleeding, the Hollywood restaurant supplier refused, declaring, I'll get over this bump on the head in a few days, but that girl won't get over hers for a long time. Madge testified that she was scared to death of Nick Giannakalis, that she knew absolutely nothing about a plot to beat him up, that she has never, never seen the blackjack and guns allegedly used in the plot, and that there was no romantic implications in her registering at the Valley Motel with Albert Tucker as Mr. and Mrs. Tucker. But in the end, Madge Meredith was found guilty on all five charges. Well, no matter what my sentence may be, I am no worse off than I was before under that influence of that domineering Greek. And she also said, it's all a mistake. I'm innocent, but I guess the jury just didn't see it that way. All her appeals failed. On January 22, 1948, she was sentenced to five to life at the Hatchapi Prison for Women. When they take me to Chihachapi, they might as well leave me there. Everything will be gone. Now here's something I find intriguing. Of the three men who were accused of helping her, William Tucker, the one who testified against Giannakalis, got five to 25 years in prison. Damian Klinkenberg was given only 66 days, and James A. Hatfield got just 30 days. Does that sound a little strange to you? And on a side note here, Giannakalis' wife divorced him, accusing Marge Meredith as the other woman, even though they both testified at the trial that there was no romance between them. And while Marge was waiting to start her prison sentence, she was also dealing with the civil suit, and again in that trial, she denied everything. She began serving her time on May 12, 1950. She went from living in a nice home with her family, with her dream of becoming a Hollywood movie star coming true, to possibly spending the rest of her life wearing prison clothes behind bars. But then, a miracle happened. A California Assembly Committee began to investigate the case. Several of Hollywood's most prominent names are interested in the Meredith case and indicate they might ask Governor Earl Warren to investigate. Actor George Murphy said he requested a transcript on the case but has not yet received it. According to the book Zazu Pitts, The Life and Career, when Zazu Pitts learned what was happening, she tried valiantly to intervene. She began a campaign, making phone calls and writing letters to various judicial departments, including the governor. Two men acted as amateur detectives, Herbert Schofield, 71, and Charles E. Wilson, 68. They worked for over a year on the case.
finally, the California Adult Authority Board recommended that she be released immediately. It is the unequivocal opinion of this subcommittee, the report said, that had Miss Massau been properly defended in a court free of prejudice, she undoubtedly would have been proven innocent of the crime with which she is now charged. And the report concluded, This case from beginning to end is a mockery of investigation, of defense counseling, of trial procedure, and justice itself. They called her a victim of a frame-up. The governor, Earl Warren, called the case one of the most bizarre I have ever seen, more bizarre than any movie. And he noted that the California Adult Authority Board could not understand the disappropriate sentences. Some of the men actually in on the kidnapping received as little as 30 days in the county jail. Madge Meredith was released on her 30th birthday after two and a half years in prison. But our story's not over just yet. Madge Meredith began to revive her lost acting career, this time in the new world of television. Raising all this money so our children can have a school. Oh, I'm certain I can handle it, Deacon. I've already laid out the courses of study. May I ask a question? Is it dangerous? You're over 30, my darling husband. And besides, you've got Carol and me to think about now. And then she tried to get back some of the things she had lost. The first thing on the list, get her house back. She brought Giant Atlas to court. And this time during the trial, Nick changed his story from the previous trials, now claiming the two had had a intimate relationship. Are you trying to crucify her? Asked William R. Law, attorney for Miss Meredith. Haven't you tortured her enough? And the court didn't buy it either. Proto-stealer Nick Giannakalis and his attorney Cletus Hattifold were accused yesterday of using the court to smear the chastity and reputation of actress Madge Meredith. And not only did Madge get her home back, but Nick was ordered to pay $11,371.85 in back rent. Weeping with joy, Miss Meredith 30 told the court, I'm so happy. It's been so long since anyone would believe me. As for Nick, because of his lies in court, he was denied citizenship and was threatened with deportation. Officer Lloyd H. Gardner cited, shocking evidence of perjury, suppression of evidence, and an almost unbelievable reluctance on the part of the defense counsel to investigate the case of the defendant. It is inconceivable that a human being could be so devoid of good moral character that he would willfully and knowingly commit another to prison through false testimony. Two studios offered her a chance to make a film based on her story, but she said no. I didn't want to do that, she said. I didn't feel it would do any good. Money isn't everything. And for Madge, good things kept happening. In September 1953, she was married to a Los Angeles physician named Dr. Charles L. Carley. And her career took off. Okay, she never became the huge Hollywood star she had hoped, but had a great acting career on TV just the same. And in May of 1955, she became the mother of a beautiful baby girl named Christine. Of course, all wasn't perfect. She applied for a full pardon, one that she claimed was promised by the governor, but he denied her request. Her marriage ended in a divorce, and that turned into an ugly custody hearing for the child. In 1963, Zazu Pitts became ill. It was Madge who took care of her. When she became ill, it was Madge who nursed her, cooked for her, and was always there day or night when Zazu needed her. Marge was remarried to Mac Hatiyama, whom she stayed with until her death. Unfortunately, there is almost no information about her second marriage. In fact, I couldn't find much on her later life. She retired from acting in 1964 and spent her later years defending and fighting for those people who were being unjustly treated. Her later years were spent with her husband in their home in Volcano, Hawaii. Madge Meredith died at the age of 86 on September 16th, 2017. Well, where did you come from? Why, you've been hurt. What happened, boy? Barbed wire? 
Let me take a look at it. Oh, well, you really got snagged. No wonder you were limping. You stay right here and I'll fix you up right away. <laughs> 